Welcome to Future Histories. My name is Jan Groß and it is my great pleasure to welcome the writing collective Planning for Entropy in today's episode. I first became aware of Planning for Entropy through their fantastic contribution to the 2022 special issue of the Science and Society Project Envisioning Socialism, a paper titled Democratic Economic Planning, Social Metabolism and the Environment. They have since expanded in terms of content and in personnel and I'm absolutely excited to feature their work in future histories since it pushes some of the most crucial questions surrounding the planning debate. You will hear a couple of authors mentioned in this episode that developed different models of democratic planning and I am Happy to say that I conducted interviews with nearly all of them. So if you're interested in digging deeper into democratic economic planning, then you will not only find many, many episodes of future histories that engage with this topic more generally, but you will also find episodes with these people who develop the models, such as David Leibman, Pat Devine or Robin Hanell. At one point during the interview, I mentioned a fantastic presentation I saw at a workshop I attended in Berlin. The person who gave the presentation is called Walter Zeug, a researcher at the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research in Leipzig. Walter develops and applies integrated sustainability assessment models, and I am happy to announce that I will soon record an episode with him too. I also mentioned the work of Tim Plattenkamp, with whom I already recorded an episode of Future Histories, which is about to be released soon. So there's plenty of material to dive into if you're interested in the topic of today's episode. And I think there are plenty of good reasons to be interested in sociometabolic planning, since we most definitely need to find a way to set up our metabolic interaction with nature differently. Before we start, I'd like to thank Sascha, Natasha, Lukas, Samuel, Fabian and Wilfried for their donations. And now, please enjoy today's episode with Planning for Entropy on Sociometabolic Planning. Welcome, everybody. Hello. Hi. Hello. So let's maybe start with a quick introduction. What is planning for entropy? Yeah, maybe I can go for this. Uh, so my name is Simon. I'm working at a university called St. Paul University in Canada. Well, the reason why we're called planning for entropy is a bit funny. Well, if, if it's funny, but it, in an academic way, it's a bit funny. It's because when we wrote this article you were just talking about for uh, science and society, we had to choose a group name because we were too many. Science and society never had five people writing for the same article. So they told us we can we, we don't have space for all those names. So you have to have a collective name for all those authors. And then we didn't know what to do. Uh, we didn't want to have only one person signing. We, we didn't know uh, what, what, what name to give. So we came up with that name who looks a bit like kind of a, a punk rock group band name uh, but we chose planning for entropy we never used it uh, afterward but a lot of people are calling us that way now because of that article even though we wrote many other articles in french and in english uh, we we are from canada and we mostly speak english and french and therefore yeah it, it kind of stick to us even though it was just uh, this one-time deal so it's it would be long to introduce everyone in our research group. We're about 12 people, about half of them are profs in different universities in Canada, and half of them are either students or in independent researcher, uh, mostly grad students. Um, so that's it. Maybe we can present each of us that, that are here with you, uh, Jan, today. Uh, so my name is Simon Tremblay-Pepin, and I'm a professor at St. Paul University, and I'm working on planning and post-capitalist economic systems since about 15 years now. So that's it. Maybe, Sophie, you want to follow up? 
Yes, um, so my name is uh, Sophie elias Paisano, and I recently finished a degree in uh, socio-ecological economics in Vienna at the Vienna University of Economics and Business, and I'm now an associate researcher at uh, IRIS, a socio-economic research institute in Montreal. And uh, my name is Mathieu Parent Dufour. I work at the University uh, du at the University du Québec in Ottawa, and uh, so I'm an economist, and I work largely on international issues, capital flows, international trade, things like that, and of course as well on um, alternative economic systems and democratic planning. So the title of your 2022 paper nicely sums up some of the main topics that we want to talk about today, namely democratic economic planning, social metabolism and the environment. How do these fields relate to each other and why is it important to bring them together? And maybe since uh, some of my listeners might not be familiar with the concept, maybe you could start by explaining social metabolism as a concept and idea. Yes, so the expression social metabolism is used to refer to the, the biophysical dimension of economic processes. And so when we talk about the metabolism of organisms, it's the process by which they create and maintain the, their structure by exchanging materials and energy with their environment. And so as an analogy, the social metabolism refers to the flows of matter and energy used to sustain material stocks. And so material stocks include both bodies, human, human bodies, and also material artifacts that are used by society. And so we think, and in general, in ecological economics, that understanding the economy as a social metabolism provides a particular lens that can be very helpful in analyzing uh, the biophysical reality of economic structures. And then it also sees the economic process with its four points, the points of extraction, production, consumption, and waste and dissipation to get outside from the dichotomy that is often there in economic analysis of only having production and consumption. What is also very useful with the social metabolism is that it has accounting frameworks that can help us to analyze in a very systematic ways the throughput of matter and energy. And then it also has then databases uh, that exist right now to help us understand how economies have right now, of course, also an ecological aspect to it. And then it's also this accounting aspects that make us think about the ways we could make use of this uh, into planning and democratic planning. And so how do these fields relate to each other? We think that in the context uh, where we are urgently looking for ways to account for ecological realities in the way we organize the economy, we think the, the framework of social metabolism could be of great use in the coordination of economic processes. And that if we are to coordinate economic processes in a way that is both ecologically sustainable and socially just, we will have to plan it democratically. And so one of the also important issues uh, highlighted by the ecological crisis is the issue of scale. And that relates to how big the economy is in relation to its natural environment and how much pressure we are exerting on it. And so then ecological economics, also based on the, the work of Herman Daly, have stressed the importance of this question and the fact that it has to be addressed on its own since it cannot be addressed in, indirectly by tackling issues of allocation and distribution, for example. So to reach sustainability, we have to collectively give ourselves ways to act upon the scale. And so that first means being able to assess it. And so the approach of social metabolism provides according to us, the language to discuss and to represent the biophysical scale of the economy. Fantastic. And uh, so basically, as I understand it, we need to find different ways through which we can address this question of social metabolism, because the way we, we address it right now is basically catastrophic, so to speak. And I mean, uh, of course, the people who are working in the field of democratic uh, economic planning have already heard of this <laughs> catastrophe and tried to incorporate the question of ecological planning into their models. And you look at models by Divine and Adaman, by Kotchuk and Cottrell, 
well. Uh, David Leibman and as well as uh, Paracon developed by Hanel and um, Albert. And so you, you notice that they try to include this question of ecology into their models, but that they do not do it sufficiently, that they lack, you already mentioned the, the question of scale, and that they have a framework through which this inclusion of the question of ecology can actually not uh, succeed at the end. So maybe you could tell us why you think that this is the case. Let's take the three canonical models, or let, I don't know how to call them, but the, the, the three models from the from the 90s, uh, so uh, Devine Adaman, Cockshot and Cottrell, and uh, Albert and Hanel. Devine and Hadaman, they are talking a lot about uh, the, the question of environment and their recent work. They are really preoccupied by this question. Uh, obviously, they are. And their, their answer is, in fact, quite simple and probably a very interesting answer. It's just they don't give much detail about it. They are telling us the way we envision the, the functioning of the economy and mostly uh, as probably your listener know already, uh, Devine and Adaman are focusing mostly on investment in their uh, model. And he said, with what we propose, we will have a conscious, the humanity will have a conscious understanding of what we are doing collectively in terms of investment and its impact on the environment. And therefore, we can take the best decisions. We agree with this. Like it's, it's possible that, that we reach that. But the question of how we will be conscious of the impact of our decision on the environment is not always clear, in, uh, at least for us, in Divine and Adaman's model. And it's a lot about we should talk about it in negotiation. Their, their model is called negotiated coordination. There's a reason for that. Uh, we, we should negotiate about it in meetings and therefore take the best decision. We think that indicators and models of how the like how the social metabolism for example functions would be helpful to know about this so so that's that's the first problem we have about Cockshot and Cottrell the answer is even simpler uh, in their main book from from 1993 uh, toward a new socialism they mostly say well environment is a political question we don't fix this through uh, market indicators or prices. We fix this through political discussion, which comes quite a lot close to uh, what Devan and Adaman are saying. But it's even, I'd say, bigger <laughs> in terms of, of what they imply, is that we should fix that by referenda. Or what we think is that a lot of question, in fact, involve the ecological uh, question. And so if for each issue we have to make a referenda, uh, we'll have a lot of referenda. Uh, so so we, 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 we think that there should be an easier way to, to take those decisions. I'm not talking about Michael Albert for, the, <clears throat> for participa participatory economics because Robin Hannell has developed his specific answers uh, much uh, deeply in recent work, like in from 2017 to uh, a book published last year. And his answer is twofold, I'd say. First, on one side, he has a way to locate uh, ecological damage that has been done to a community and to for this community to be compensated. I won't go in the details to that but mostly it's the goal is for people who are who receive harm for from pollution to get some compensation which is all right in itself like it's not a bad thing to do but it's quite limited and it does not at, at all the question of the environmental equi equilibrium that we need to reach and to to live in harmony with on the other side which is more interesting on that level, it proposes development plans at the level of the environment. But here again, as for the two precedent models, it does not offer how we would do this and from which point of view and how is shadow prices, for example, 
are helping us to understand what is the state of the environment right now. In fact, in his recent book, he takes one or two sentences to tell us there will be a ministry of environment. He'll take care of providing the data and we'll, we'll uh, go from there. That's all right. But l let's say, <laughs> if I'm being generous, I would say that uh, we would like to know how this ministry will function and on which data it will base its, its decision and reflections. So that's where we come in, saying that we we need to have a broader vision, uh, mostly based on what uh, Sophie just told you. Fantastic. So uh, let's take a closer look at this uh, broader vision of uh, what we could base our decisions on, basically. So it seems as if what you're proposing is that we should go for uh, developing a better idea of the throughput of matter and energy and uh, how this relates to the social worlds that we engage with. And of course, it would be absolutely helpful to uh, get a clearer picture of how the these uh, two things relate to each other. So maybe you could go into how you approach your own framework, how you uh, think that these um, measurements, these um, data points also of uh, material throughput and energy can help us with developing alternative ideas of democratic planning. Well, I'll try to be simple because the idea is quite simple. How we will do it will be complicated, but what we want to do is quite simple. First, we have to build a representation. That's what Sophie was talking about, a representation of how this uh, social metabolism works and is in relationship with the rest of the environment around it. So that's that's the first thing we have to do. And that's a theoretical, that's like a, an abstract representation that will help us understand what's happening. This does not exist right now. Like there's 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 no way for the moment in the capitalist system we live in to know exactly what are those interactions. Uh, friends around the world are trying to do this and are trying to build such a representation, but it does not exist at the moment. Then we think we should think about the long-term planning of society in terms of what we have called in a recent paper socio-metabolic planning. So the the notion we are we are developing here is that long-term development and long-term vision of our society should be integrated. So so when, for example, Devine and Adaman are talking about investment planning, which all the others also do, we should, when we do this, take into consideration what will be the, the, the relationship of what we will do and what do we want for nature around us and what and how we want to develop inside uh, the environment. So th this is a kind of a vision of social ecology if we if we can say like it's a it's a it's an understanding of us as inside a first nature that that has to develop that has to be maintained in equilibrium and also we we want to see where we want to go as a society inside that and when we want our planet to uh, to go in terms of 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 the development of its environment so this is the kind of planning we want we want to uh, import into democratic planning our message to the democratic planning gang is to say we have to include all of this in our planning not just what humans do we have to include what's happening to the environment and our relationship to all that. And to the, eco the economic, eco the ecological economics gang, we're saying, well, we have to do all this democratically. It's true democratic planning that we can attain that, not through some kind of technocratic decisions, uh, decision making that would, that would not be uh, the best way to reach our objective. So th this is kind of the, the two messages we're trying to send on both ways. And, and on that, for example, one of our member, uh, Bengi Agbulut, uh, wrote a very interesting text in Ecological Economics a few years ago, telling them, well, maybe we have to take to understand what's that. And she wrote it with Fikret Adaman, who's a, who's a Pandivine uh, partner in this in this. Uh, project that they have about uh, democratic planning. Uh, so they wrote this article saying to the ecological economics uh, group, 
Well, you have to look at what's happening on democratic planning side because those two worlds have to come together. And that's what we're trying to do. So in order to kind of merge these worlds of ecological economics and democratic planning, we will need to have some elements that come together. And um, you describe uh, a couple of them within your paper. Um, you quite clearly state that we will need to construct deliberative planning institutions, that we will need to institutionalize non-reductionist categories that express social metabolism in biophysical and ecological terms instead of uh, output terms. And you say that we need to create a framework to manage the biophysical scale of the throughput and the nature of ecological relations inherent in the social metabolism of a post-capitalist society to come. So there are a couple of things we need to build, so to speak. Maybe let's start with uh, looking at the alternative indicators because, uh, Simon, you already mentioned many of the models right now do propose things in very broad terms, but still sometimes they lack a concrete idea of how we could get to implementing those ideas. And uh, crucially also, they lack indicators that might serve as a basis for the collective decision making. So we will need to develop uh, indicators that are not based on market prices as it is done right now. And we can see how absolutely catastrophic uh, the outcome of this uh, mechanism is. So you detail that market prices are absolutely not the right way to go. But what are the indicators that we need? What are the alternative indicators that you propose that can represent these biophysical relations to the uh, social metabolism better than markets can. So uh, what do we have to develop in order to get there? Right. Well, of course, that's a complicated question. And that will vary depending on what we're talking about. Um, raising tomatoes won't be the same as organizing a whole ecosystem in some cases or uh, mining some uh, some other resources, right? So, so different sectors will require different sets of indicator. But the broad idea here is that, as you say, market prices are, are not adequate to address uh, this for a variety of reasons. And currently, of course, what we have is we have plenty of planning in capitalism, but it's, it's largely around financial uh, imperatives. And therefore, uh, with, with like from units, uh, which every time they can pawn costs on other people, so then those prices don't account for that. But beyond that, even if we were to say, okay, like we're in a different systems uh, system anyway, can't we just sit together, figure out priorities, and then put a set of prices and have people interact around that? There's even an issue with that, and that's like prices or or financial um, quantities. Uh, we think cannot represent like the whole diversity, the whole variety of um, things we need to care about. So there's this concept uh, in ecological economics, the incommensurability, sorry for the pronunciation, of uh, those different dimensions that cannot be put on a single scale. So there's no way to get prices right in a sense. We, we know market prices don't do a good job. But there's also no single set of right prices that could do a right job, which is why Simo was talking about um, shadow prices before. That is, we'll need prices for some stuff, probably. There are going to be some zones where uh, people interact around those, those prices, and that'll be fine. But we'll also need all sorts of indicators to understand what kind of impact our um, actions, our interaction with the environment are, are having. Coming back to my tomatoes, for example, we'll need an indicator of water usage. That's not a price, that's a quantity. There's no way to get a price of that and then hope that interactions will get us to the right quantity. Uh, it's a quantity and we'll need to figure out what kind of total water usage we want for agriculture, what kind, uh, what, what amount we want for tomatoes, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we, we might get to this question later on, but of course, 
This also influences how we see products that might come from outside the community as well. Uh, so there's going to be a whole different accounting in terms of just not just uh, equating the lowest cost or whatever when we think about trade or, or things like that. So that's the broad idea to have this multiplicity of indicators, biophysical indicators, some prices, and I would add maybe a third category of, of social and political indicators uh, related to uh, to what we want, what we wish, for example, in terms of uh, basic needs. Are we reaching those basic needs? How are we doing it? How are we attaining this, et cetera? So again, the specifics will have to vary in terms of sectors, in terms of industry, but that would be the broad idea. Maybe let's dig a little bit deeper there, because I mean, for me, it's easy to imagine a scenario in which we are provided with these additional indicators. This is happening already in capitalist contexts where uh, life cycle analysis or something like that might provide ideas about uh, what kind of resources went into a certain product. So this is kind of happening right now. Uh, however, you write that the tools that you propose could be used to, and I quote you here, plan in detail the throughput composition and size of a given economy, as well as break down this planning process to the micro and meso levels, uh, end quote. So this, of course, sounds very, very exciting, but still I need some more elements in order to get a clear idea of how we can come to a coherent set of um, mechanisms, so to speak, that will together form a political economy based on this ecological paradigm. So uh, maybe you could help me paint this picture in my head <laughs> in order to get a better idea of how these different elements that you propose can become factors when it comes to the active coordination of an economy instead of uh, being a, an additional factor of information that is also uh, supplied in capitalist context today? Yes, so that's a very good question. And I think let's maybe start by going back to what Simon talked about, the long-term economic planning, socio, well, the, the long-term meta metabolic planning as well. I think... The thing is, uh, socio-metabolic planning will be done to like organize need satisfaction and also in the context of defined planetary boundaries. But then the thing is, we will have to establish a long-term social objective uh, regarding socio-society-nature relation uh, that is in relation to defined planetary boundaries, but are not the planetary boundaries themselves. So it's important to distinguish between the social objective and the planetary boundary that is not seen as an objective limit to social action, but rather as an important guide to democratic debates. And so then we establish a social objective that comes together with certain indicators uh, that can be quantified in terms of certain accounting frameworks from the social metabolism, for example, that can help us to track and see how are we doing in, in front of these long-term goals. Yeah, so we have some these long-term objectives um, that are socially set, and but then we have to relate that as well to this day-to-day uh, and year-to-year -year organization of economic processes. So then, secondly, we can see the use of social metabolic like indicators uh, in relation to regulations so or exposed, like you first said. So to monitor exposed the progress relating to the social objectives, and to see. Uh, with indicators from the social metabolism, but also with a whole set of other biophysical indicators, how we are doing in relation to our goals in the long term, but also related to how it is going right now and to understand how it's going in comparison to what we thought it would be going right now in relation to ecological limits. And at this point, there would be a ton of data. And so that's also a very important thing that we will have to think about people in certain workspaces that will be dedicated to problematize metabolic issues in production processes, but also to formulate the synthesis of this data into useful indicators. 
And then that brings us to the, the third step or the, the third way of envisioning the role of social metabolism in more of an active coordination, what you were asking about. And so we, we want to plan the next year's production and consumption by taking into account first where the last year stands according to the long-term social targets, and also second, the ecological implications of particular products and methods of production. And so this means that we are looking at where we stand, how we thought it would go and how it did go in, in the end to see where we are now and to plan for the future for the next year and readjust the social target according to the scientific knowledge that exists on ecological limits and planetary boundaries. Then we can use metabolic data related to specific products, like you said, regarding uh, by doing life cycle analyses, and then to assess their material use throughout their whole life cycle. And using this data to see, for example, specific products, how their production and their consumption would affect the social metabolism of uh, during the next the year to come. And then to see how products and particular infrastructures, for example, can lock us into a specific path of resource use for the next year, but also for the years to come. And to see how, for example, how construction, constructing specific types of buildings and specific types of transport infrastructures will have impacts on the ecological impacts of the economy for many years. And then we're talking a lot about these indicators related to social metabolism, but it would be also necessary to use a variety of indicators and sources of knowledge as well to do so. And so we have to discuss also metabolic flows in relation to their place within provisioning systems and to see how these ecological flows are related to other social processes and to see as well, for example, how they're organized to fulfill some specific needs and also how they are related to different kinds of meanings for different people and for different groups in the economy. And all of this have to be discussed at different levels in, in order to integrate these different kinds of information. And so the idea is that we can give all the relevant information, for example, by having synthesis uh, that are done by some groups and workspaces that are de dedicated to that and to give this information to people in structured deliberations and decision making to have a mix of decisions that are made democratically but also some data-based decision making that is done more on a day-to-day -day basis. So I gave three different examples but that the idea is that we have several levels of planning and monitoring to set objectives and to follow our progress in relation to these objectives. And, and maybe just to uh, say it in another way, in fact, the larger metabolic planning acts like a constraint on the annual and day-to-day -day planning. It tells us, okay, we have this larger goal we want to reach, like we don't want to reach that threshold of biodiversity, for example, uh, on the planet. Hence, we have to reduce the emission of this pollutant that kills that animal in that part of the world. So if we don't want to use that pollutant, it, this gives us an indicator uh, saying, okay, we have this maximum of emission that we can emit from that pollutant. How do we give the permission, the, the, the amount of emission we can give, how do we distribute it? And how do we prioritize to which kind of production process we will allow to emit that, that pollutant and that comes into annual and day-to-day -day, uh, work, annual planning and day-to-day -day work. That's what I meant by it's kind of a constraint that we're putting on our planning when doing the metabolic, uh, the metabolic planning, the long-term metabolic planning. Very, very interesting, I have to say, because um, I was recently also on a workshop in Berlin where somebody did a really, really great presentation on how uh, life cycle analysis could be fed into democratic planning. And uh, one thing that he stressed is that since the tool is 
not that complex. It would allow for a form of bottom-up planning as well, in which you would have these constraints that you talked about, Simon, and then people within the different um, socialist enterprises, for example, would be able to feed in the data from the ground to the informational system through life cycle analysis, and therefore we would have a combination of central and decentral elements. And uh, so uh, I think this is a really, really, really interesting way to approach the whole thing that you that you sketch nonetheless there are of course open questions <laughs> so one would be do you have an a bit of an idea of, of the specific mechanisms and also institutions that one would need in order to make this happen because uh, Simone you already mentioned you, we would have to come to a workable set of constraints we would have of course a different informational base in order to deliberate about these questions but still i mean at the end we would have to have global constraints on our social metabolism and we would have to agree upon these global constraints and this is of course <laughs> a kind of a difficult thing to <laughs> to get to so uh, do you have an idea of different mechanisms or institutions that might help with uh, such a small task i wouldn't answer straight away <laughs> because i think it is uh, quite an important question it is definitely one of the key challenges to Uh, coordinate the the scope of decision making in regard to the scale of ecological impacts because of course every economic social economic decision has an ecological impact uh, or an ecological dimension to it and then of course local decisions also have global impacts and Of course, then I guess global decisions, if we take all of it together, of course, has impacts in a very differentiated way in different places. And so I would say we do not have like specific institutions right now to propose. And I guess it is open for creativity and discussion outside from the fact that we will have to coordinate these different levels of decision making in having global goals and also specific local targets and monitoring at these different scales. I don't know if someone else wanted to add something regarding that. Yeah, I, I think what you what you just mentioned there, that we don't have specific institution, that's coming back to the presentation of our group in the beginning. That's that's also one way we like to proceed, that is not to have a specific template to say, okay, like here's if we follow uh, from A to Z, uh, we'll have a nice cake <laughs> with democratic planning written on it at the end, but rather a set of preoccupations and sort of basic processes that are central to us and from which communities or groups of people can then design uh, on their own institutions that that can work. So that's, that's one key thing. So I, we don't have a specific... Um, Uh, set up in mind. That said, I will add, we can see this as sort of a, a hierarchy of uh, responsibilities, both on decisions to be made in terms of production, consumption, and all that with respect to the environment, but also into following up, um, in, following some of these indicators. Uh, for example, Uh, local communities will certainly be better placed than anybody else to understand how a local ecosystem is doing, right? So even beyond broad biophysical indicators, just the health of an ecosystem, uh, maybe you can see by knowing a forest, by taking a walk in it. And that's something um, that like, maybe technocrats somewhere would not be able to do even if they had, I don't know, satellites to look at the said forest, right? So there's this whole uh, source of information that will be central in the understanding of how exactly uh, this interconnectedness is working out in, in practice. That's one thing. In terms of the responsibilities of following up on how the targets are working and if, if we should uh, rearrange them and do things differently. And also responsibilities on, on what kind of decisions uh, we make. And there, I, I don't think 
there's any shortcuts that can be made from making those decisions about what's global and what's local. Uh, we'll have to discuss it, we'll have as a group to determine which is which and, and who gets uh, to decide. But we can imagine a system whereby every level has inputs into what other levels do, right? Maybe some kind of federative structure, for example, where uh, local local boards or something or local decision um, bodies can send people to uh, higher ones or different ones, and therefore the information circulates. Maybe one last thing I'll say is that for this to all work, that information has to be both open and available, and that's that's crucial, right? That we don't have five experts somewhere who know everything about the environment. We give them a call every time we need to make a decision, but really they're the only ones knowing what's going on, right? So it, it's crucial that we don't have that and that instead this information is open and it's palatable as well, right? It will have to be made in a way whereby even non-experts or people who don't have specific knowledge about a given issue can still make an informed decision about this if those uh, democratic planning processes uh, are to work. And maybe just to add two little things, because your question is so broad and, and so stimulating that we have a lot of answers. I think that in the previous models, like in the three canonical models, we had mostly when they were written in the 90s. It changed. It changed afterwards. But there, there were two answers to your question. Divine Adaman had an answer, which was, we will take decision on the broader issues collectively. And then we will, you know, have this being sent down to different uh, production units uh, from, from a, a, a plan that we take a decision upon as a nation or as a country or as you know a region whatever but we have this this level and then there are you know local and regional places that are that are receiving okay we, we've decided that at this level and then it goes down at the opposite participatory economics was saying well you cannot take decision on things that does not matter to you concretely so take decision on what you want to produce, what you want to consume, and from that, a plan will be built. Uh, that's that's the contribution, I'd say, from uh, Robin and Michael. The very interesting and stimulating idea in participatory economics. Both came to a place where there are more, there's more space for contribution from the other side, I'd say. Like Robin started building investment plans, development plans, and all that that are uh, of, a, of a higher level. While in the, in the recent work by Fikret and, and Pat, you see a lot of things about local autonomy, uh, democratic uh, uh, autonomy from the production units and all that. So we all agree in the end that there is a balance to be found in this. And that's, that's not a big surprise, let's say. We we all know that I I, I wrote an, an article uh, on on criteria about uh, democratic planning most and one of them was scope and and I think it's uh, it's it's evident that we have to have our say as a participant to this economy about what's happening in our day to day work but also on our larger objective. The day to day one is easier to think about like we can we can know how we can manage self-manage a company or you know where where a workshop or whatever when it comes to a great a greater plan a larger plan how can we take decision on that level uh, clearly as Mathieu was saying we are not developing a model if we are working on something is to go from those models to modules uh, that will be, you know, that that could be independent and that could be thought of independently from the from the rest of a model, and maybe that could be implemented in a society when when the time is not ready for other section of the economy to be democratized. One of the questions we're asking is what is the kind of information that we need for citizens to participate consciously and with all of the information available to them, but with not an overload of information, because that's the danger. As uh, Sophie was saying, we can have tons of data, you know, factors and all that. But how do we take a sensible and intelligent decision on such questions 
and have enough data to take the decision. This is what we're working on right now. Like it's 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 part of the reflection we are having about modules of planning and and developing them. So so your your question was right on what we're what we're working on right now. Excellent. I think um, we can even dig a little deeper because I think this is a very uh, crucial point. So maybe we could get to a point where people can imagine what this might look like because we have now established that there will be alternative indicators that are uh, trying to maybe also visualize um, the biophysical throughput Uh, matter and energy questions related to all kinds of materials, to labor, human labor, um, also uh, animal labor, I guess, and uh, all these different elements. So we will have a plethora of information and data. And of course, as you already mentioned, this uh, is immediately overwhelming. <laughs> so uh, there will need to be some kind of translation as well, I guess, in order to let people take part in a meaningful way in this deliberation. So uh, do you have an idea of what this might look like in concrete terms? So if we have this large set of information on the complete throughput, biophysical throughput uh, on the one side, and then we have the need to come to a informational point that is usable for a broader public in order to take part in this deliberative process. What's, how do we get these two together? What's the, what's the process that uh, needs to take place between these two elements? Because there needs to be some kind of translation, different mechanisms, and it doesn't have to be one mechanism, I guess, but many probably, and also different sites that uh, allow you to engage with these different types of data. And of course, also maybe different intensities of information, because some might be willing and able to kind of take in a more abstract uh, level of information. Others will need to have information that is kind of more easily accessible and stuff like that. So how can we think about this relationship between broad deliberation about these topics on the one side and the uh, information overload on the other, maybe? One thing here is that this vision of a, a social metabolism, uh, metabolism allows us to segment, in a sense, this decision process. That is, once we have an overall vision of what's feed, what feeds into what and exactly what affects what, then we can say, okay, well, some of these decisions will really have an effect on A and B, but not really C. That, that's not the way it, it communicates. And though, so we don't have to constantly decide on everything at once. Uh, what we want is an overall vision where we understand what feeds into what that's crucial. That is, that decisions are not made without considering the impacts on all sorts of zones, and then it, it comes to bite us uh, years later, right? So it's important to have the broad vision, but we don't have to make the broad decisions every single time. We can devolve some of the local decision making about uh, forests, for example, for example to a local group of citizens who would be more concerned about this particular issue and people maybe 50 kilometers down the road don't really have to have a say in that and and it actually <laughs> may be better if they don't have a say because they're not directly uh, concerned about that so this this social metabolic vision allows us to say okay This, these two decisions we'll need to make as a group, and then we'll need to be to have data and and, and also some information to do that. But all these other more local decisions or more regional decisions can be made at a different scale by smaller groups of people who are directly concerned within, of course, boundaries and limits that are set in the overall picture. So therefore, we can imagine the segmentation of decision making so that we're not constantly making decisions that feed in, but separating it, we can make some a lot of local decisions uh, with confidence that it fits in an overall picture and that we don't have constantly to go and feedback with this different pictures every single time we decide to take a walk or not in the forest. 
I'll follow on what Matthew was talking about and and answer your question in the more imaginative way, Jan, that you were suggesting. Like, how could this? What what could it look like? And it's just an idea. It's not the result of research. What I'm talking about, but it but it can give you uh, an idea of what it could look like. Let's take two indicators that are known right now that we have access to and and that we that we're familiar with well at least a bit familiar with the first one would be the nine boundaries that we should not, the nine threshold that humanity should not cross for uh, the envi- the, the planet not to blow up okay Th- this is one known you know indicator that we already know about and if we take for example what the OECD has done with the uh, how, how they call it better life index so the, the that gives you you know an idea of uh, how different population in the world are uh, uh, living in terms of poverty rates, transport, health, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we already have those indicators. They, they already exist. Let's imagine we do them better. We do them with the help of uh, social metabolism. We have a, a clearer representation of all that. But we can summarize those representation into indicators of various type of indicators that give us an idea of where we are at the moment. So every five years, for example, it's just an example that, you know, the calendar and all that is just to give us an idea. Every five years, we have a broad consultation of the whole community saying, this is where we are in terms of development from what we get from science and what we get from, you know, our, our collective work. This is the, the status of our relationship with nature. This is what we produce. This is the, the quantity of needs that are fulfilled with a few indicators, but that we think are uh, central in terms of politi- political decision making. We will need we will need good designers. Eh? That that will be <laughs> very important. Uh, we will need you know people who can think about how to present data, how to do that. But but those resources exist. We have that already in in our society. And then we can have a broad discussion every five years, let's say, where we say, okay, where do we want to go? Where do we want those indicator to be at? Let's say we are approaching a threshold in terms of an environment question, and let's say in biodiversity, we say, okay, this threshold is, we're almost there. What can we do not to reach it? Well, this would mean, and then we'd have an explanation of what we should reduce in terms of consumption or in terms of production, et cetera, et cetera. And then we take a decision on where we want to go. This then translates for all section of the community into constraint that will be put on our, for example, our work unit. I am in a a work collective. Uh, We are, let's say, building fridges. We we are producing fridges. When they told us, well, this material that you're using in your fridge, we don't think it's a priority to put it in fridge. We, We must use it elsewhere. We don't have much. We don't want to use much. Hence, you have to change your process or build or build less fridge. Okay. Then we say, what are the innovations we can make to replace that product that we don't have anymore? Or should we just propose to build less fridge because we don't have a replacement for that? And we enter that into the process saying, this is the consequences that will have to, this decision that we took collectively as on us then maybe prices for fridges will go up. Maybe we will have different type of fridges or maybe we won't have some, I don't know, a specific and funny add, add-on that we add on our fridges that will not work anymore uh, because we don't have the material to do it. Uh, but, but we will change production accordingly in our workshop and then we will say that to others and the planning, the annual planning will take care of it in knowing that everyone is adapting saying oh fridges are going up the price of fridges are going up maybe i'll i'll keep my old fridge and and won't buy a new one this year because it's too expensive and i'll wait for for when it breaks up before changing it 
Uh, we hope everybody will do that and socialist society, but but maybe they need indicators to tell them not, not to buy a new fridge every uh, three years. So that's that's the kind of link between the two that we have to develop. And it's certain that there will be questions about how we discuss. This, this must be like... What in a seminar that I organized about post-capitalist economies, uh, one colleague said, we will need a, a group of persons that are specialized in how do we take democratic decisions and that are training not only uh, others to, let's say, facilitate discussions or, or organize data in a table that everyone can understand or, you know, those kind of things, but also to train people to interact in a democratic fashion and in democratic decision making. And, and this will be important as well. So there's a lot of culture changes that, that must happen for us to reach that goal of, of collective decision making. But we don't have to make decisions about those larger questions every two months. We, we can set goals and say, okay, when do we reach that goal? And maybe every year, maybe every six months, we'll find, we'll find the, the good rhythm that, that's, that's easy to find. But the idea is to have something that we take big decision, we have and and we give people the right to have a slim version of the information they need or to expand like like you do on a website and have more information if you want if they want to to <laughs> to go down the rabbit hole <laughs> and understand exactly but yeah but why does this thing cost more okay it's because we changed that and that and that and they can go there and see if they want to but they're not forced to do this, so we reduce information o- overload to do that. But we would need a very good designer <laughs> for, for that to happen. Okay, I think we will sidestep the question how you would make the decentralized actors accept the constraints that will come from a, a central element, because this is, of course, an important type of negotiation, <laughs> let's say. So um, I think we sidestep this for a moment at least in order to take one step more deeper into this question of economy-wide energy and material flow accounting because this is kind of what you, I think, tried to sketch. I mean, at least as far as I understand it, what you're proposing is that we will really try to track the resource use of all of the materials that are involved in our social metabolism. So if, and this is maybe just to illustrate for the audience what uh, the, the extent of what you're talking about, Simon, or all of you talking about, if we have a microphone, I have a microphone in front of me, then um, if I order the microphone, I will be able to click on the information button, let's say, of this microphone, and it will show me which kinds of materials went into the production of this um a microphone, maybe also which kind of communities were uh, affected by um, the use of these resources, because this will be an important aspect as well. And um, all types of informations that are related to the biophysical element of this um, use value, so to speak. And so this will be the informational basis on which, let's say, central planning institution of some sort, question mark, will be able to provide information about long-term plans, broader plans, and um, kind of therefore create a sort of framework in which the decentralized units will be able to operate, if I get that correctly. So my question then <laughs> would be, how is accounting being done within this framework. So if you talk about economy-wide energy and material flow accounting, we will have this centralized institution, centralized in the sense only that the information will need to come to a a uh, centralized point in order to be processed there. It doesn't necessarily mean that it is centralized in, in terms of political centralization or hierarchization. It shouldn't be actually. But there will be a place, an institution, where you will have all this information, which I talked about when I talked about the microphone, will come together. But then 
how is it being processed in order to get to a plan based upon this plethora of information? What are the, uh, the ways through which this weighing also takes place? Because you will have to have some kind of weighing in order to uh, decide why we should use this production method in comparison to another one. And right now, of course, as we know, Uh, we do have market forces that uh, force us into this decision. And this is what the Austrian economists praise as if this was the holy grail. So we would need to find an alternative element, an alternative uh, logic and an alternative mechanism in order to provide for this um, necessary task, so to speak. How would this happen based upon this alternative paradigm? Yeah, on the issue of information, right? It's, of course, every time we try to fathom the entirety of the information we would need to have on your microphone, for example, to like everything you named, it seems like a lot. But I would argue this information already exists. It's just that the firm making the microphone has it somewhere. Probably not everybody in the firm is aware of all of this. Of course, it's separated in the department that's segmented. But the information exists, right? We're simply talking about figuring out a way to integrate all this, making it open and bringing it forward as a, a, a means to make decision. We, we we don't need to collect that much more information. We need to systematize it and maybe change the hierarchy. That is, maybe even the information, uh, the, the environmental information already exists. It's just that it's not considered in the decision making. Uh, we would have to bring that forward. So that's one thing that it, for me, the information gathering part it is not a major, uh, a major issue. M making it so that we can actually um, process all this, that's a big challenge. I, I agree with that. But the information itself, not too big. But what you are getting at is deeper than this. Uh, and it's a major question. And maybe uh, maybe Samar or Sophie will have the, the perfect answer here. But I would say that's still something we're thinking about. How to figure out arbitrage between different different options in a sense, like if we have different processes, different ways to make the same thing, for example, we want to grow tomatoes, right? We like tomatoes, we want to have them uh, grown in our community, okay. But then we'll have different ways of doing it. Maybe more water, less human work, just to make it very simple, or less, uh, less water, more human work. That's going to have to be a decision that, that we make. Either way, we could have a tomato. Currently, as you were saying, uh, we'll have market forces determine sort of price of different things. And then we might make on a financial basis, let's decide that because financially that brings us to the lowest cost, let's say, or the simplest way to do things. So that's how the arbitrage is done. But because those market prices don't make don't take into consideration all sorts of factors, they're incomplete. They're not they're not the proper way to go about this. But the different options still exist. Right, the fact that we have this so, the social metabolism um, framework in place does not reduce ways of doing things or or alternatives to simply one, and then we just follow that. We'll still have to make decisions on that. Now, of course, there's the broad boundaries that we were talking about that cannot be um, surpassed in any event. Right, whatever we choose to do, whatever we do, we can't go beyond that. Otherwise stuff keeps working but how do we actually do the arbitrage and who gets to decide that the the fridge makers uh, get that much and that the other people get that much and the tomato growers get that much and all that uh, once again I, i don't think there's much shortcut around having a political discussions about what priorities end up being so in a sense the the technique does not give a proper answer to that. The technique gives a set of options, a set of alternatives, and then we get to decide together how we make the arbitrage, what our priorities are, what we deem important or less important, staying within the limit. So in, in the abstract, that's that's that would be my entry point to that question, but it's, of course, uh, not simple. Maybe that's where we disagree. I don't know. I would say disagree. I agree with the idea. Okay. First information question. I think Matthew is right. It's 
it's not a simple question in terms of it's easy to do, but it's quite easy to conceive. Uh, but it will take a lot of work and a lot of time to accomplish. But in a way, I'd separate it in two streams that we have to follow. Let's say we put together an economy that is a democratically planned economy tomorrow. We will start asking a production unit to give the information about the products that they're uh, getting to a, a common uh, database. Uh, saying, for example, taking your example of the microphone, I've built the base of the microphone or the internal the internal product that there's in it. I used da da da. They were coming from this this plant and this old plant and blah blah blah. And we get the information from those other work units and we put them together. And at the end, we have the total of where it comes from and what it has done. In the beginning, it'll take time because we'll have to integrate work unit into this database and everyone to, to give its information and all that. It won't be a one-year thing. It, it'll take time to develop. But at the same time, and that the second stream, we have macro data. And we have, we have averages, we have ideas of what's happening. Like we know how many microphones we produce. We know how many, uh, how much steel, how much plastic we use every year. We can do divisions and average to have a broad idea of what goes in which sector of the, pro of the economy. And in those sector, what kind of uh, product are being done with each thing. So even for planning at the beginning, we can rely on those larger, uh, let's say, uh, those larger entities to give us an idea of where we're going while we build the more precise and detailed uh, vision. So I think if we go both ways, if we have those both stream, like detailing more and more the macro one and building on the, the micro one, I think we can get to a level of information that will be interesting. Then on decision-making, I agree with Matthew that some question will be political in the end. But I think that we will have so many constraints coming from a different sort, from, from different factors, from different, different factors. And, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you examples. So we, we add one constraint that we agreed on uh, already is the macro one. We decide collectively we don't want to do this on an, uh, on an environmental basis. We want to consume, consume less of this material because it's polluting, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's one starting point. Then we have demand. We will still have people wanting to consume fridges or cars or whatever or you know the, 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 the things they want to consume. We have this information already, and we know people need, for example, to eat apples and to uh, to buy other uh, stuff. So that's an information that we already have. And then we have the preferences from the work from the production units that say we we want to do this or we want to do that, so we want to less work hour, we want to 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 work less hours. Sorry, uh, we want to have to we have innovated into doing that specific way of doing a fridge, like as Mathieu was saying, there are many options to produce something, but those options are limited in terms of numbers. Like there's three, four, five ways to do something, but there, there are not like 3,000 or 10,000. So you can, you can say, okay, this is what we need. This is the scope of what we need to produce that amount of, of fridges or of cars or whatever. Hence, when you put all that together and when everyone has participated in, in saying what they need and what they want and the resources we have, there are still political questions to be resolved, like economic question to be resolved politically in, in a discussion. But you also have a lot of answers coming already from the data you've accumulated together. And that, that does not come from a central planning process that comes from a decentral planning process and you put them all together then a few answer comes up enough i think for us not to to make all decisions politically because if we were to make all decisions of the economic system politically we'll have no time we would have no time to do this we have some questions that that must be fixed uh, by 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 the relationship between the constraint the economy will be in, 
those constraints will be in part political because we will have decided that before. We would have said three years ago, we want to reach that goal and we have that limit. But still, it, it will give us a shortcut in, in the current planning to say, okay, we cannot consume more than this. Therefore, we have to make a decision. And, and when we'll have two or three options, we'll take a look at what do people want? What is this polluting? And, and we'll have a few criterias we can be based on to take decision. And some of them will, will need to be made politically at the local, regional, or national level. Maybe I wanted to add something on that, because, Simon, now you kind of uh, talked about demand as something a bit like if it was given, people want stuff, they want maybe fridges or cars, and then we'll have to, we, we take this into the planning process, yes, in a democratic way, and then doing something about that and figuring out how we organize this. But I would add that of course there also needs to be broader reflections maybe also on on the longer term but also on a on a short term basis about uh, this consumption and the role it has in uh, the fulfillment of specific needs and that's of course a whole branch of discussions and debates about planning that we are also working on the fact that the consumption has to be put into context into Uh, the social provisioning systems. And so there has to be discussions on uh, what are what we consider to be basic needs and then how we want to satisfy those and then how to organize this collectively this satisfaction of these needs in a way that would be compatible with, of course, the ecological goals or targets that we set ourselves. And then that's also a way to get outside from only always responding to a certain demand, people wanting things, but also to first organize social provisioning in a way that is sustainable and ensures that everyone can have the basic things to survive and thrive in a, in a society. Absolutely. Uh, I think that's a really important remark, Sophie, uh, because uh, I mean, <laughs> I'm quite involved in the debate around democratic planning as well. But sometimes I ask myself if the focus might not be a bit off in, uh, in terms of we will have a huge sector, hopefully, that is simply like organized through mechanisms of universal uh, provision, you know, it will still need to have some form of, um, you know, organizing principle, of course, but at least in my book, uh, most of the needs that, that I have will be covered through a very, very broad understanding of universal basic services, which are unconditional. And uh, compared to that, the much more smaller amount of like uh, everyday consumption uh, of maybe some luxury goods or something is in terms of especially material throughput, <laughs> much smaller, hopefully, than, than the amount of um, throughput that is covered through different means. So this is a really important remark that you made, Sophie. Nonetheless, uh, for both of these realms, or of all of the realms, we uh, will have to have some form of as we already established, accounting uh, system or some kind of tracking system, so to speak. And maybe as a last question in this direction, there's always a huge fuzz around the question of universal unit of account, yes or no. I uh, get the sense that you are firmly placed in the direction of no universal unit of account, but maybe units of account and plural. I didn't really understand whether or not this, what, what you're proposing involves some form of that artificial unit, or if it's like going full calculation in kind. So is there an idea uh, that you have about this kind of technical question of uh, whether or not there will be a unit of account or not? Because this, of course, kind of opens up a, a, a box of 
questions that are attached to <laughs> to um, how you relate this artificial accounting mechanism to the biophysical elements and uh, so on and so on. So, uh, how do you? What's your uh, take on this question of unit or units of account? Well, I can try a first take at this, but it's for me personally. And it's not something we we have uh, at the center of our research questions right now. But for me personally, it's not such an important question as the debate makes it right now. For one reason is that we can there again go both ways. Uh, we can have a universal unit uh, that that would look like consumption credits, like you you have that amount of credit for your own consumption, and that because it's. It's quite useful, you know, to have an idea of how much you can consume, what you can buy with this. And, you know, it's it's something that in the day-to-day -day life can be useful. But it's obvious that when we talk about investments, for example, to, to take like the, the completely opposite usage of the, the, that kind of, of units of account, when you think about, you know, when you think about investment, you want to take into account a, a multiplicity of factors of, uh, and of indicators. But maybe that in your current, you are talking about needs and goods that we that we want to consume. When you are in your day-to-day -day activities, maybe you don't want <laughs> to have 18 <laughs> different factors when you buy you know, one, one product and say, well, do I, can I buy this amount of, uh, of iron <laughs> or this? You don't want to go there. So having a unit of credit that is simple in the day-to-day -day life is totally possible when on the other side, you do the planning of the investment and the planning of the, the larger uh, consumptions uh, that you have to do with a variety of, of units. So for, for me personally, there is, yes, a usefulness in something that is universal and that can be uh, used by everybody and that represents the day-to-day goods that we want, goods and services that we want to buy. And on the other side, have a multiplicity of, of factors and indicators when we talk about uh, larger. It's, it's like, I, I would say that I'm, I'm taking kind of a bit of a Pat Divine position here. But like for the day-to-day -day, uh, market exchange to take his vocabulary, I don't really care if there is a money involved as long as you cannot, you know, accumulate it in obscene ways and things like that. We could, we could make limits to all that. But for investments and for important economical matters, I know that it's not sufficient. We need more than this. But having this will help us know what people prefer, what people, because if you use it as theater tickets, as Cockshot and Cutrell would, would tell you, Uh, we know how many of those of that bread people bought instead of this bread. And therefore, we know which one is preferable to invest in. And, you know, it gives you a lot of information that is useful for economic planning. So why not use it? But we, we do not have to make it central. We do not have to make it the only decision we take it from. And we don't have to, we don't have to make it what money is right now in our system that's that's what i would go to yeah and and to add to this and of course we haven't solved everything right this is an ongoing project in fact right now uh some of us are working on prices like for, for all the talks we've been saying about how prices can't do everything they might be useful in a variety of contexts and that's what we're trying to determine what are like what's the boundaries of that context right what uh, what realm where uh, can they be useful and we can keep them and what realm we need to really make decisions on on different bases and in that way we can also figure out that if we have this this social metabolic accounting broadly right and if we've determined boundaries to production and and made decisions about how that production and how that use is is going then exchange or consumption becomes much less of a driver in that sense of, of that issue, right? And so, which is why individuals don't have to worry necessarily every single time about the, the number of units of iron they're actually consuming where they're buying this. If we're saying, okay, we're going to make this whole um, 
set of things available in the part of our economic lives where we were not it's not basic social provisioning it's not something we're, we're offering but it's places where people can make choices because between, between tomatoes and apples and i don't know what but we set boundaries and then within that to have a unit of account um that's common to everybody that allows for individual preferences and all that to be expressed i think that that's fine and uh, that can be done in a way that does not go over those uh, ecological boundaries, for example. And that allows for a smooth coordination uh, between people, but it would have to be bounded very precisely. What exactly is that realm? But within that realm, yes, let's do it. But other decisions, especially with respect to production and, and resource use and all that, that will need the variety of, of indicators. And from there, uh, we, we can't have this, this simple uh, unit of account. So I think part of the story here is we really need to differentiate those different types of decisions that we're doing. Those production decisions, those resource use decisions cannot be made with the same unit of account that we can then use for conservation, at least in my view, again, like we're working on this, but uh, but it's important to really differentiate those two things. Whereas currently uh, in the system we have, the one unit of account uh, essentially serves for all these things. And even though it may not be uh, appropriate for uh, all of them at once in the same, uh, in the same way. I think maybe uh, just to add on that, that's also maybe why I framed the question in plural of units of account, because, um, I mean, one model or at least a broader approach that I might point you towards is that of Tim Plattenkamp, who has a forthcoming book in which he uh, picks up on this separation between consumer credits on the one side, which are, of course, as Simon already pointed towards um, have to be thought of as similar to theater tickets, so they will expire after you consume them. So there's a distinction between these consumer credits and production tokens uh, on the other side, uh, which you, Matteo, already pointed towards, that the production type of the, uh, side of things will need to be handled through different mechanisms in order not to reproduce the um, problems uh, that easily come up if um, like uh, factors of productions are being handled through the same uh, unit of account as it is done in uh, capitalism with all the problems that uh, go along with this. So, I mean, we kind of touched upon this, but maybe there's uh, something to add. Uh, I think the last question already points in this direction. I would be interested in uh, how we can bring to Gather the different logics of different spheres. I mean, you point towards this question when you say that the the different elements within the four-step process that you describe, namely the points of extraction, the points of production, the points of consumption, and the points of uh, waste, that all of these different uh, points within the process can not be uh, reduced uh, upon each other, but that they will have to be governed through different inherent logics, so to speak. But then, of course, immediately questions of translation pop up, so to speak. So how can we kind of respect the inherent logics of these different spheres while at the same time uh, create some form of compatibility. So I guess there's a question of, uh, what's the word? Intersections. <laughs> so we will need to, to uh, find devices or mechanisms or political processes, uh, or I guess these will all be political processes as well, to kind of govern these intersections between the spheres, so to speak. So uh, maybe to kind of open up uh, what we already talked about, because I think this is really important, because right now one of the problems we have is that a certain logic, <laughs> namely the logic of uh, economic efficiency and profit maximization, dominates um, many of the other spheres. And we would, of course, not want to um, reproduce this. But as I said, this leads to a point where questions of um, intersection and valuing the values of other logics come up, I guess. Yes. So... The cohabitation of different logics, it's interesting that you put it because even in 
we often say, okay, well, in our village or our community or our group, we'll do things this way. And how do we talk to the next people over, right? And that's an, in, an important question, which I'll address in, in one second. But what you bring up is very interesting that even within one system, if we say that we have a production logic or, or a logic with respect to resource use and a different one with respect to consumption, how do these things talk to each other? And um, I think this is a central question. So we, we've done some work on this. And what we've come up with is we need some kind of interface, some kind of, of interface in between those different realms. Or if you think back about um, what I was talking about with different communities, uh, maybe what like in the current, uh, in current setup, we would say international trade or whatever, because we have this... Um, this vision of, of states like doing trade with each other, which of course is not really what's happening, but different issue. But even the, if we have this, uh, a, a given system in, in a locus, how does it communicate to a different system? Because we can imagine that not all at once, everybody will adopt the exact same way. And that's fine too, right? Like even in the transition towards democratic planning, we can easily imagine that one group would go one way and a different group would go in a different um, direction. So how could different systems communicate with, uh, with each other? And from that, we'll need to have an interface. And in and translation can be uh, can be done in one way by requiring information that the other system might not be producing in and of itself. Um, so that's one part that's important. Like just to make it easy, uh, again going from talking two communities talking to each other. Assume one is still capitalist, and then in one other one we've we've tried to do this this kind of transition towards a democratically planned system. And we have all these biophysical indicators that we care about, um, but that, that are not explicitly taken into account in the capitalist system. How do these two communicate? Well, in order for the democratically planned economy to, um, to really include the possibilities offered by the, the capitalist economy, in its own planning processes, it would need to have all sorts of new information. So that interface, one of its main role in order for that translation to happen is an information gathering role. So again, coming back to my tomatoes, if we care about water usage and in the other system, they're simply a price, right? They're saying, we're gonna sell you tomatoes for uh, $2 a kilogram, let's say, or perfect, uh, fine, great, good. How much water do you do, 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 does it take to make a kilogram of, um, of tomatoes? Because we care about that. And if we discover that it takes much more water, then that changes sort of the ratio or the actual importance we give this good. So if in that if in our society we have a consumption target as well as a production target, then that good coming through needs to be taken into account in terms of its material flows it would generate, right? And not only its price, so the water uh, used in order to make it in this case. So the interface, first thing, gathers all the information so that the indicators that are used in the democratic economy can account for whatever's going on in the other economy. At the same time, there needs to be a process designed, at least in my view, such that there's some porosity, right? There's not an isolation of a democratic system. We, it needs to be protected. But at, at some point, we need to design it so that there's a bit of a, a competition in good practices, I would say. That is, if the system next door really is using much less water, then maybe it's interesting to get tomatoes from there rather than get tomatoes at home. If ever, for whatever reason, we feel as a society that tomatoes are very useful and are needed in that society. Once we have taken into account those biophysical indicators, social indicators as well, right? What kind of work conditions? All these indicators, once we can translate, then we can make a decision and include it in the broader process saying, okay, well, we have options A, B, and C to make tomatoes at home that require arbitrage between different dimensions and all that. But there's also option D. We could get the tomatoes from next door, and here's why. Uh, here's what uh, it means. But then if we get tomatoes from outside, what does it mean in terms of our consumption targets, in terms of our production targets as well 
uh, they'll want something for the tomatoes, right? So in the same way, we need to consider material flows in, in, in both directions. So um, it's a little bit the same thing. So that's one way to conceive it in between, uh, in between communities, I would say, with different economic systems. Because in a sense, we'll need global planning to figure out environmental problems on a global scale, like uh, carbon, as we're seeing these days, certainly. Eventually, hopefully, we'll get there. <laughs> but in the meantime, a community will have power over whatever it does, right? We, we don't want some kind of imperialist setup, whereas, well, we're pure environmentally speaking, so we're going to tell you how to do stuff, right? That, that This cannot um, be the solution in a way. So if we decide for ourselves, we set those targets, we have this interface, collect information, figure out the arbitrage, make those decisions within our own planning process. That's one way to do it. And also translate the units. In terms of your question internally, it has a similar logic with interfaces in between those different steps, I would say. But it's slightly different in, 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 in that we have a broad vision of all of these moments. Right, the, the social metabolic uh, view says that we need to consider every single one of uh, these moments. So one does not happen in complete isolation with the um, with the other. But to, to give a, a quick example, again, suppose we go from production to consumption, and in consumption we have this unit of account common to everybody and common to every product. Uh, that does not have to consider every single dimension every time, but that we can use some, some kind of um, currency. And in the production uh, processes, we have all sorts of indicators that are more um, biophilosophically based. Then we can imagine a process whereby we set boundaries and we make decisions with respect to arbitrage, with respect to resource use before it gets to consumption, right? At which point we have a broad quantitative division of what will what will be available for consumption and then allocation within the consumption moment can take place with a different currency that does not have to be linked. We'll have to take a, talk about distribution, of course, of who gets what in terms of allocation, obviously. But aside from that, we can then have a different process whereby stuff is like exchange, distributed, allocated according to this different unit without having this unit to talk to the other one explicitly every time. So it's that's a bit of this, this interface vision we can, uh, we can think of. A question that we did not yet touch upon, but that you do uh, have work currently only in French uh, about is the question of needs. This is, of course, again, a huge question. We are talking about a lot of huge questions today, which is great, I think. Um, so you published a paper about the question of uh, needs. And to me, uh, when reading some of the bits that were uh, kindly translated for me by Simone, uh, I kind of got the idea that the conclusion more or less seems to be A, let's cover the basic first, basics first, and B, uh, let's talk about what the basics are and kind of engage in a political process about uh, this question specifically. So maybe you could walk us through your findings when it comes to the question of needs. Well, it's, it, it has been a question for us uh, since the beginning of our discussions, like needs keeps coming back at this. And, and I think you, you brought it yourself, Jan, when uh, talking about what you touch should be covered by a universal uh, provisioning system. This is, this is another way of putting the question of needs uh, in, 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 at the center. What I would say is that our first question was a question of needs definition. And there's a lot that has been written on this. We, we made a lit review on, on needs and needs coverage. And not only is it talked a lot in economics, but not that much because some parts of the economic realm are not talking about needs really much. But a lot of people do, and a lot of people do in other disciplines as well. Anthropology, even nursing has very uh, interesting things to say about that. So you have tons of things written about this. But the problem is that there is still this idea that we could get access to a very scientific and objective human need. 
So the first thing we wanted to do is debunk that idea that that you know there there is a person somewhere or a collection of people that could provide us with you know this is what human needs. Uh, this this doesn't exist obviously. Human needs are partly cultural, part, partly uh, subjective. And that's all right. They are still needs. It's not, it's not because they're not objective that they're not needs. But there are there is another school that is saying, if they are partly subjective, therefore, there is no difference between needs and the rest. Uh, the, the needs are anything that we can desire. And we disagreed too with this definition because we were saying, well, not really. Like We all know that needs and desire are different. I can need something, and if I don't have it, I'm putting myself in danger, for example, or I, I won't live as long as I should, or you know, I will put my health in trouble. And desires, well, it's things that I would love to have, but it's not necessary that I have them. Even though it's not objective, we know that there's a difference. And we know in the end, and that's where Nancy Fraser's text from the 90s, I, I think we, we are kind of nostalgic and work only on text from the 90s, but that's that's another that's another question. We we took that text from Nancy Fraser, and, and she wrote a, a bunch of them, but about the, the notion that the definition of needs in our society, in capitalist society, is a struggle. There is a struggle over needs interpretation in our society. What is a need? And and I'm 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 really happy that uh, Nancy Fraser chose the word need in terms of the word right, and I think it helps us in understanding what we're talking about. And we're not talking about human rights or natural rights uh, where liberalism comes in and then it fucks up all the discussion. Then we we need we need to have a discussion about what we think we need. And this discussion will be, and that's that's what uh, Fraser brings in, it will be political in the end. We will have to, yes, we will be helped by science. Like science has a lot of things to say about what, what human needs. But in the end, to agree upon something, we will have to discuss it. So it comes to what you were saying, but in a very convoluted way, but still it comes to what you were saying. It's, that we have to discuss about need to to select to define what needs are in our community but we think it will be very useful for a planning process to have that unit to say this is what we need this will give us what is the 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 most basic production we must do to cover our needs and this gives us the line. Sophie, in the beginning, talked about two lines. One line is the planet boundaries that, you know, we, we cannot go over that. That's, that's kind of our roof. And the ground where, where we have another things we can go under is fulfilling human needs. We don't want people to die out of hunger or, you know, be in a, in a difficult situation in terms of health. Hence, our production and consumption must be between those two lines. And we did this research to, to say, how do we define the, the bottom line? And this bottom line has to be defined politically and has to be thought of in terms of this universal provisioning that you were thinking about. Not only because, as Matthew was, say, was saying, we need some space to make our own decision, even according to our needs. Like if you're talking about my health, yeah, I want to make a certain decision. At some point, someone will decide for me if, you know, what, what's best for me is to have a treatment for cancer. Well, I, I don't have much decisions to make. I can, I can take it or not, but that's about it. I will not choose this treatment or this one. But when it comes to food, I can prefer apples to oranges and I want some leeway to decide which one is better for me. Uh, even though it, uh, a nutritionist could tell me that I should eat this, I, I still want to have some, some space to, to decide. Hence, there is this space that we're trying to define that is not exactly, this is what we need first in terms of like chronologically, we, we wouldn't need to 
you know, fulfill the needs. And then when all the needs of everyone are done, we'll start thinking about what we do next. Obviously, it's not that way. But but we know that we cannot go under this limit. So it's it's to trace a limit and also to ask a very complex question. And I think I'm reading right now uh, Simon Suturletti and um, Stefan Meritz's uh, book. And I think that they, they approach that question in a very interesting fashion, a one, one that I, have, I hadn't seen before, about the willingness or what they call voluntariness of fulfilling the work that has to be done for us to cover our needs. And this is a tricky question. When we put the, the, the ground level, when we said we need to have those, ne- those need fulfilled and covered, who will do the work so it is fulfilled and covered? And what do we do with the people who say, well, I don't want to work for that when we need work to be done for everyone to be able to eat. It's a tricky question, but I think that I, at least our research is bringing it back in when we normally try to avoid it. And, and, and I'm thinking, for example, at the three canonical models where this question is when it's treated, treated in one or two sentences and very problematically, I think. Uh, so we're bringing that back and asking the question, okay, what do we do with this? Bringing the question doesn't mean we have answers, <laughs> but, <laughs> but at least we we are discussing this very specific question and how can we uh, focus on that? So so that's where the needs in our discussion. And I think that there will be a process when the question of need will be asked politically to include more and more things, more and more uh, services and goods in what we need from a political perspective, people will say, and and at some point, I, I think this is the transition that we talk normally in classical socialist theory between socialism and communism. But the transition will be, will be slow. It's the moment where we will be saying, okay, well, it's normal for people to have this for a living. Is it vacations? Is it, you know, we, we did that already. It's, it's, it's already in uh, Northern society and in the, in the global North. We did that already. The, this discussion already happened. But I think this will go in a larger way and it will grow with the time. But we will think about it consciously, knowing that there are limits. So it's not everybody does everything and anything he wants. It's we have to think about living harmoniously with the the, the environment we're in. So we cannot fulfill every desire. It needs to be thought of as needs. So, 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 yeah, that's, that's more or less the, the reflections we were having and, and probably Sophie and, and Matthew want to add things on into that. Uh, I can't hear you, Sophie. Yeah, I was wanted to say I didn't have anything to add for now. No, it's the it's same, same from me. I think, yeah, Simone did a good job. Okay, so there's a last question that I ask all of my guests, and it is, if you think about the future, what makes you joyful? Well, I can take a stab at that one. It would, in a sense, for me, what, what makes the future, what makes me joyful when I think about the future is potentialities, right? When we think about the environment, it's it's really easy to get the dreary vision of the whole world disintegrating around us and like this thing descending into uh, into chaos. Uh, we can think about the the, um, the 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 oft repeated sentence that it's it's easier to imagine the end of the world and the end of capitalism and and in some ways, but at the same time, when we start looking around, what we see is is people, communities, collectively designing uh, new responses every day to the challenges that come. So this this human potentiality. That even with challenges that we can't even think of right now, <laughs> those we can see are already important enough, but that humans will be able to devise answers, to devise solutions uh, to that. 
to devise unforeseen and, and unforeseeable uh, response. So the, in a sense, the prospect of being astonished and impressed as to what we'll be able collectively to come up with to address these challenges. Um, yeah, that would make me joyful. I, I had a similar answer to that. Yeah, indeed. I think for sure there'll be hard times and challenges ahead for sure. <laughs> but I think that if we think that we can organize right now and build strong solidarity networks, for sure there will be a powerful resistance to whatever will be happening and also beautiful alternatives that will emerge out of it. And I think for me, so it's not so much the fact of being surprised, but more of seeing these powerful acts of resistance and organizing and also creating these alternative yeah, prospects and alternative proposals uh, that will necessarily happen and emerge out of this that makes me joyful. I think that when we think about the future, there's two kind of people, and I will resume that into two utopias. There, there's one side that is uh, Edward Bellamy uh, kind of side, you know, techno-utopian people that think that we we will live a better life. In fact, it will it will be kind of a retro futuristic life where everything will be done by machines and all that. And, and, but it will be still communism and will, will, will be all equal and all that. And there is more the William Morris side, uh, news from nowhere, uh, being the, the fiction I, I would be thinking about. And I, I think I'm more on this side, which is life will be, what rejoice me is that life will be simpler. I, I envision a world where we will have, and I won't, I won't do the, the classic Marx quote here, but where we will have time uh, for, you know, just enjoy, enjoying life for itself, taking time with friends, uh, reading philosophy, discussing, and having less burden imposed by a system that is exterior to our will. And, and we were, yes, we, as my two colleagues said, uh, we will have more of a say into it, but also more time. We have a very short amount of time on this herd. And the fact that we spend it pursuing goals that are totally, uh, <laughs> that, that have no consequences in the end, in terms of, of happiness that we, that we have, that we give to other people around us is, is just stupid. Uh, I, I hope for a system where we have time to enjoy life for real and enjoying it for real is really simple, in fact. It's time with people you love. It's time with friends. It's time with learning. And, and I hope that a system that we build together as a humanity comes to this kind of maturity. I think that humanity can, can look at itself at some moment and say we could spend more time doing those things instead of pursuing devaluation of value. Yeah, that's it. Perfect. Thank you so much for being part of Future Histories. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Jan. Thank you. That was our show for today. Thanks a lot for listening. If you want to support Future Histories, you can do so on Patreon. For this, visit patreon.com slash futurehistories or you can simply tell a friend that you liked the show and that he, she or they might like it as well. Thanks a lot and hear you in two weeks.